Tonight's lesson um, is about being able to accept change while still standing for the truth. We've had some really um, good summer series uh, lessons. I have the list here. Um, my faith is the foundation of my life. That was the first week, Brother Mike Gerganis. My faith is the foundation of my home. My, my, uh, practicing my faith every day means that Christ is the center of my marriage. I strive to imitate Jesus. Harold Savage was here and, and spoke about how practicing our faith means that faith triumphs over fears. And we talked about reaching outside our comfort zone. We talked about local and uh, foreign evangelism. We talked about finding our place in the church with Brother Jeff Archie when he was here a few weeks ago. Uh, we talked about managing conflict. And then last week, of course, uh, Michael Whitworth was here and was, was talking about um, having a faith that's unshaken and, and holding on to it no matter what is going on around us. And as we were preparing these um, lessons almost a year ago, when we were sitting around in our planning meeting and talking about what we wanted to do, we wanted this to be a very practical series of lessons so that we could say, all right, we, we quote James 2 all the time that, that we practice our faith. We show our faith by the things that we do and by the way that we live. So what are some ways that we can really show that? Some of our speakers have done really well this summer and really given us that. Some have um, been a little lacking in, in, in that they delivered the message they wanted to instead of the one we wanted you to hear. We're going to be a little more deliberate in our instructions next year. But, but, but I hope you've gotten a lot from this. A lot of effort is put into contacting these speakers and assigning topics that really are meaningful. And I hope you've gotten a lot out of this series of lessons this summer. If you have any input or things you'd like for us to um, think about for next summer, the planning is right around the corner. It's about time to start planning for 2017 as we get closer to the new year. Um, but I do want to thank everybody for their attention and for, for their attendance this summer during the summer series. I, and I do hope that it's been beneficial. You can uh, go ahead and open your uh, Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Not a place that we usually go, but that's where we're going to start tonight. 1 Chronicles chapter 12. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. And, and we're in the middle of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a big transition period. Hope you'll stay with me here as we go through this. We're in the midst of a big transition in Israel. Um, Saul has just died. Anyway, this is the end of his reign as king. And now David is about to become king. And the leader tribe and the, and the soldiers and the fighters are trying to, to decide if they are going to follow David. And, and it goes down a whole list in chapter 12. We're not going to read all those, but it talks about David's army growing and how it becomes stronger. And it gets down to verse 32, um, chapter 12, verse 32. It says, and the sons of Issachar, listen to this, there's two important descriptions here. The sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times I mean, they understood that this was about to be David's time, that David had been chosen a very long time ago to be king. Said they had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. So there's two important things there. They understood the time, what was going on in the world, and they wanted to do what was right for God's people. And I think that's a perfect um, description of how we need to be. We need to be aware and understand the times. We can't live in a box. We can't live secluded from the world. We can't say, well, I know all that's going on out there, but I'm just going to keep myself completely away from everything in the world. We're supposed to keep ourselves pure and unstained and not affected by the world, but we can't pretend that it doesn't exist. And then we're supposed to having figured out what's going on and understanding the culture around us and seeing what the world is like. Figuring out what God's people have to do. So what we got to figure out is in this culture that we live in, how do I accept what's going on and still remain a strong, faithful Christian? And listen, that is a huge challenge, both for us to figure out together and to apply. But if we want to be pleasing to God in this world that we live in, we have to figure out how to do it, how to understand the times and to know what we ought to do. I think that there's a few things that we have to do. Number one, we have to become all things to all people. Turn over there to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 with me. This is a passage that's familiar to all of us. I'm 
going to read this in a way that's, that's very clear for us to understand from the New Living Translation. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 19. Listen to what Paul says. He says, even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under the law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who were under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so that I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share in their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. So what Paul says is that every group of people are in need of the same salvation. He said, when I'm around Jews, I live under Jewish law. That became a bit tricky, right? Live under Jewish law. When I'm around Gentiles, I don't, I don't worry about Jewish law. When I'm around people that are weak, I, I, I go to being weak. You remember the story about the weaker brethren and their understanding of meat that had been blessed by idols or, or dedicated to idols by the priests? He said, yeah, I know that we have a right to eat that and these things don't exist and it's okay for us to do that, but the weaker brethren don't understand that. So I'm going to do what I can to yield to the weak so that I can win them. He says, I'm going to do whatever I can to find common ground with everybody so that I can reach them. So that example still resonates with us today. When we're around people, we need to figure out how we can find some sort of common ground with them so that we may have the opportunity to reach them. And that's difficult to do sometimes. Um, Our world is classified by uh, different generations. See what I did with this clicker here. There it is. All right. The first generation is called the silent generation. These are people born between 1928 and 1945. Who's in the silent generation? I was asking uh, Curtis Kingsley if he was in the silent generation this morning. He said not even close to being in the silent generation. But that's what this generation is called. Um, Now uh, groups are starting to refer to the silent generation as the elders. So I think that's probably got a little more more, uh, dignity associated with it, the elders. These are those of you who have been through a lot in life, born into a great depression, Um, If you were born in the first part of that generation, had to fight and and, and scrape to get through and and survive and to make it. These are the people who fought World War II and got through that period in American history. These 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 are some very interesting people who have seen the world change so much. The silent generation. Then the next generation, the baby boomers. Soldiers came home from war and this, there was this huge baby boom. And, and it's this growth in our population. How many of you are baby, boom, baby boomers born between 46 and 64? All right, for a long time, the baby boomers were seen as America's most influential Generation. I mean, the baby boomers were what dictated what was popular in retail. You know, the baby boomers dictated what was important in culture. And this was a very important generation in American history. This really changed things. Post-war, uh, America thrived economically. I mean, that post-war generation was so important to the development of our country. What about Generation X, born between 1965 and 1980? Generation Xers. All right, you were the first generation that people started to complain about. Um, first generation that was started to be a little selfish and was ruining America. And Generation X is all you heard for a long time. All right, <clears throat> this is my generation of folks. How many of you were born between 1981 and 1996? Between 1981 and 1996. I'm sorry. No, 96. Older, older or younger millennials, both of them. That, this is us. This is the generation that people are complaining about now. If you go and you read generational research, the millennials are the problem. The millennials are the ones that we can't reach religiously. The millennials are, are the ones that are sit around with drinking their Starbucks and on their cell phones. And they're the ones that are demanding instant gratification and everything. Millennials are 
what's ruining the world. But millennials are the generation that's catered to by everybody. Now think about, think about what millennials expect. And I'm talking about me because I'm part of this. Um, if you're in uh, the silent generation, you went from never seeing a television to having what you have on television. Now think about that now. You went, you went from, from silent movies to Netflix on demand. I mean, you've come a long way. But for millennials, for my generation, we didn't know anything. A black and white television, what's that? So, so, so we've become maybe a little bit spoiled, so we expect things to be perfect. We get a new iPhone every year. We get all kind of new digital technology. You can go and pick up a 50-inch television for four or $500, and instantly you have the, the clearest picture you could ever imagine. Millennials are, are, are the generation that are talked about. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. What about this last generation? Generation Z. This is the new generation. Born after 1997. Any of y'all in here? All right. We're still figuring out what to do with y'all. The research is still, is still there. But I can guarantee you it's going to be problematic. Um, the millennials used to be called Generation Y, but for some reason they got changed to millennials. So we've got these different groups of people. We interact differently and we view the world differently. And then we've got to try to reach these folks spiritually. So what we have to figure out is how to find common ground. So how's the world changing? How are we changing from the, the elders, the silent generation, all the way down to millennials and to Generation Z? Well, one of the areas that the world is changing is on moral issues. I want to read you these numbers. These are scary. Who's under 25 in here? Under 25? Okay, just, just a few. Um, this is a survey taken by the Pew Research Institute for people under 25 years old. This is a survey on morality. It said two-thirds of the under 25 segment, or 64%, had used profanity in public well, at least once a week. This is talking about things that have happened at least once a week. So two-thirds of the under-25 segment use profanity in public compared to just one out of five in the baby boomers, or 19%. The younger group was nine times more likely than the boomers to have engaged in sex outside of marriage. That's 38% of the under-25 generation versus just 4% of the baby boomers. The under-25 segment was six times more likely to have lied Three times more likely to have gotten drunk and have gossiped, and twice as likely to have observed pornography and to have engaged in acts of retaliation. Wow. So it seems like um, as the world should be becoming more enlightened, it seems like maybe it's becoming um, a little, or falling a little farther into the dark. That morality is changing, and it's not changing for the better. What about religious people? What about our views? I got a couple of pictures up here, and, and, and we could pick any major social issue that we wanted to, whether it was um, abortion or, or whatever we wanted to choose. I just happened to choose um, homosexuality and, and, and how the way that Christians or those that claim to be Christians are looking at this issue. This is a chart. This is, uh, members of Protestant denominations who are now more accepting of homosexuality. The first number you see here at, uh, at the bottom is in 2007 versus the larger number in 2014. And we can go through and, and look at the group. Some of these are pretty alarming. You know, we're sometimes confused with the United Church of Christ. United Church of Christ members 2014, 82% approved of homosexuality. Think about how that's changed. I'm, I'm proud to, to look at the Church of Christ, even though we're not a denomination. And a lot of times the research on Churches of Christ is, is false because there's no central headquarters to call or anything like that. But Churches of Christ in 2007, 31% were okay with it. There's 35 in 2014. At least we're standing steady on, on those that believe certain things. But what that chart tells me is that even those who claim to be Christians on these moral issues are ignoring what the Bible says and just sort of going with the flow. So what about officially sanctioned? This is just individual members who were randomly called on the phone. They didn't have to tell their preachers or anything. But look at this picture, and, and this is going to be kind of small for you to see. But this is a list of 
major religious groups who have changed their stance or either stayed the same on same-sex marriage. Certainly, the Church of Christ is not on here because there's no headquarters once again to call. But look at this. All of these groups, Episcopal Church, Lutherans, Presbyterians, the Reformed Jewish Movement, the Quakers, and the United Church of Christ, they, they sanction... Not just approve of or turn their eye or like they don't see it, but they sanction now same-sex marriages. These groups over here, they still prohibit. And then these groups over here say, well, we don't really have a clear position. This is the world that we live in. It's changing. I've never gone through and asked our teenagers what they thought about it. And maybe not even some of you, but maybe some of the people that you sit in Bible class with every Sunday. I wonder what they would say if we asked them whether or not they thought that homosexuality was okay. Listen, morals are changing. In fact, in this postmodern culture that we live in, a lot of people would even stand up and say, you you know, not only do I not really agree with what you say on morals, but I don't even think there's such a thing as absolute truth. That's literally what postmodernism is about. There's no, there's no such thing as absolute truth and whatever the world thinks and the culture changes, I'll just sort of go with that. And, you know, there's really no right and wrong. It's just kind of what everybody believes. Changing world around us. This is what the Barna Research Group says about absolute truth and morality. It says a majority of American adults across age group, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status, and political ideology. So this is everybody. They express concern about the nation's moral condition. So what we have is a group of people who say, well... There's no such thing as as absolute truth. There's no such thing as morals. But then you go and ask these same people and they're worried about how they see the world constantly changing. Listen to these statistics now. These are people that are surveyed. They've said they don't believe in absolute truth, but they're asked about the nation's moral condition. The proportion is closer to 9 in 10 among the elders of the silent generation. So 90% of of that generation says that they're worried about the world. 87% of baby boomers, three quarters of Gen Xers, and millennials report concern. Similarly practicing Christians, 90% of those are more likely than adults of no faith or those who identify with a faith other than Christianity to say they're concerned about the moral condition of the nation. Though measurable differences exist between population segments, moral concern is widespread across the demographic board. So here's what I'm trying to say is, yeah, the world has said there's no such thing as moral absolute. Everybody can do whatever makes them happy. But that has created a vacuum. So what it's done is, well, the traditional values are gone and we don't believe those anymore. But here we have a group of people who does not know what to believe. And here we stand in a unique position of having the truth and having the ability to tell people what to believe. And now the silent generation is no longer people who were born in the 20s and 30s and 40s. It seems like the Christians are the new silent generation. We have truth. We have a vacuum. We have an opportunity to fill a void yet. We just don't do it. So here's what we have to do is we have to find common ground with everybody. Look, I know that's difficult. One of the hardest things that I've ever done as a preacher was about two years before we moved here in Phoenix City, we had a lesbian couple that started visiting our services. I wish you could have seen the looks on people's faces when that couple walked in. There was no denying that they were a lesbian couple. They weren't trying to hide it. The, uh, the, the, one of the women was a daughter of one of our members. So they, they came for the first few weeks and she sent me a message on Facebook. <clears throat> she said, I just want to make sure that everybody is welcome at your church services. And in the meantime, I would had almost every member of that church call me and pull me in the office and say, hey, do you, you know, it looks like we have this couple that's visiting here. And, you, you know, what, what are we going to do? Are we going to tell them they can't come? What, what are we going to do? And every time I responded with, we're going to love them. We're going to teach them truth. We're going to hope that they become Christians. And look, man, that was uncomfortable. But, but 
I told her, I said, look, everybody is welcome. We're not going to change the message and the truth of what the Bible says, but you're more than welcome to come and, and worship and, and hear the truth proclaimed. Wrote an article in the bulletin one Sunday about the issue of homosexuality. Neither one of them said a word. They eventually stopped coming and they went on to another church and I came to realize that they were just there to, to see if they could cause trouble or rile up, but we have to love people. This big issue right now that's in the news is um, uh, a growing, I really call it a public infatuation with the transgender community. Um, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's sort of funny. Seeing Bruce Jenner in a dress is still kind of weird to me. For those of you that saw him as an Olympian, I'm sure it's a lot stranger to you. And, uh, and you know, I, I go and I see this and, and, and it it's almost boggles my mind to think about, you know, the biological conflicts that are brought up by this issue. Because forever and ever, people have been born as a man or a woman, as a male or a female, and now people are trying to tell me when I know better that, that that's not the truth. You know, common sense dictates that you're either male or female. But I read a story several weeks ago about um, a transgender um, female, a young man that was confused and thought that he was a male, and he was beaten and, and killed by people who hated him because of this confusion that he had. And I, and, and I thought, man, you know, I, I know that I don't understand this and I know that, 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 I, that I don't accept it and I know that it's wrong, but could I ever hate somebody so much that that's what I wanted to happen to them? And look, there's all kinds of different peoples and there's all, there's all kinds of struggles and we have all kinds of different divisions and there's all kinds of sin and perversion out there. But here's the one thing that I know about every human being walking the face of the planet. Number one is they have a soul. Number two is they have sin. And number three, there's only one way for that soul to be saved from sin, and that's the blood of Jesus. And so we have to find some common ground with people, like Paul did. And I'm not saying that we, that we change our stance and that we start accepting everything. I'm not saying any of that. What I am saying is that we love people in a way that we can hopefully find a way to plant the seed of the gospel of Jesus in their hearts. And it's difficult. It's difficult to go to somebody who doesn't speak the same language as you and try to tell them about Jesus. It's difficult to go into a ghetto, somebody that's had all kinds of struggles that you could never even think about understanding and talk to them about coming to your church. It's difficult to go up to somebody who's had all kind of different experiences than you and try to say, hey, let me, let me tell you about my Savior. But we have to do it, and that's, I think, what Paul's getting at. Morality is changing, but the truth is not. And we still have that obligation to take the truth to the world. I know we don't have a lot of time left. What about truth versus tradition? Turn over to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. Paul says, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Listen to this in verse 8. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven. So he says, if any person, any angel, anybody preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, using some repetition here, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Truth is unchanging. The gospel will not change. But it seems like sometimes that we get confused about the difference between truth and tradition. Turn over, if you would, to Matthew 15. Matthew 15. Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 3. 
He answered and said to them, Matthew 5, Matthew 15, 3, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father and mother, whatever profits you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father or mother. And thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, draw near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Wow. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. So we're told here that there, is, there are things that are truth. Things that are unchanging. Things that God has delivered to us. And then, according to what Jesus says about these people, these these Jews who he calls hypocrites, that they also had traditions that they gave equal credit to, if not more authority to. They gave more authority. Listen to this, if it sounds like anything you've ever heard of. They gave more authority to their traditions than they did to their doctrine. Sound like any religious climate maybe you've ever heard of? We have to distinguish between what is truth and what is tradition. And and I wrote down, uh, just jotted down this afternoon a few things. Things that are true. Things that are mandated by God's word that cannot change. Number one, baptism for the remission of sins. The world may tell us, oh, that baptism, that getting wet, that doesn't matter. That's very clear in scripture. That's something that we have to do. Biblical teaching and preaching. We're told over and over that we need to go and take the message to the world. Scriptural leadership. The way that we organize our leadership will never change. We'll always have elders and deacons that meet the qualifications of the Bible. That's a, these are non-negotiables. Things that the Bible is very clear about. Singing. The fact that we come together and that we all join together with our voices and sing is, is a clear direction taken from Scripture. Taking the Lord's Supper and taking it every Sunday. Clear example in the Bible, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. They came together on the first day of the week for the purpose of breaking bread together. These are non-negotiables. These are things that can't change. These are things where I can open the Bible and point to them and say, I know why I do that. But there are other things that sometimes we take with just as much seriousness that the Bible never talks about. I I just wrote down five. The order of our service. You know, we have absolute freedom as long as we do the things in worship that the Bible's given us instruction to, to do them in any order. I want you to know that we could still go to heaven if we had the Lord's Supper after the lesson on Sunday morning. Can you believe that? Changing the order up. If we did a few more songs, a few less songs... And we did the contributions separate from the Lord's Supper. They are separate things. If we, if we chose to have the message at the beginning, if we got rid of announcements, if we moved around the scripture reading, whatever it, whatever it was, that's, that's a tradition. The way that we do it is a tradition. And there's nothing wrong with tradition. Tradition is wonderful as long as we don't make it doctrine and bind it on people. Here's another one I wrote down. Our meeting times. You know, We here at LJ meet at the scriptural times of 9.30, 10.30, and 6 o'clock on Sunday evening. What if we moved it up 30 minutes? If we met at 10 and 11? Wouldn't matter. What if we met at 5 in the afternoon? What if we didn't meet on Wednesday night anymore and instead we met on Tuesday or Thursday? We have complete freedom in that. The reason that we meet at the times that we meet is because of tradition. Sunday school. People have talked about Sunday school. It's one of, been one of those hotly debated things. Sunday school started as prison reform in England in the 1800s. A guy named Robert Rake said, you know what? These prisoners, we want to make them better. So on Sunday, they're going to have to go and learn the Bible whether they want to or not. That's where Sunday school came from. So the reason that we meet for Bible classes is because a bunch of prisoners did it a couple hundred years ago. Certainly, Bible class has its benefits, and we're talking about how churches grow through that. 
But we don't need to pretend like that it's something that came all the way back from the first century when it's not. It's a tradition that we still follow. The dress code. I was listening to somebody the other day and uh, they were watching something on TV and this person came out in this long flowy robe. And they said, can you believe they make that preacher wear that every Sunday? And I said, well, guess what I have to wear every Sunday? Not a robe, but if I got up there on Sunday without a coat and tie on, every one of your eyebrows would raise. Because traditionally, because of our culture, the preacher has worn a coat and tie. Nothing wrong with that. But it's not doctrinal, it's tradition. Here's another one, offering the invitation at every service. You go and you find me a scriptural example for that. Well, there's not one. Is there a scriptural example, though, for calling people to repent of their sins? Absolutely. John the Baptist offered the invitation everywhere he went. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We should certainly give everybody an opportunity. But if we came together on a Sunday night or Wednesday night and we didn't formally offer the invitation, there'd be nothing wrong with that. Our elders have set aside a specific time every time we come together that we do that. But those are traditions. So what we have to figure out in our mind is when I'm talking to somebody and I'm trying to figure out is what I'm talking about doctrinal truth or is it tradition? Traditions are wonderful, but we can't treat them with the same authority and respect as we do traditions. We have to make sure we remember that, especially when people that may not be familiar with our tradition, they come in and they ask, hey, why do you do that? If we're not armed with a biblical answer, we may just need to be honest and say, well, that's just the way we've traditionally done that. And I think sometimes we have to be honest with ourselves about that. Because a lot of the fights that I've seen in churches in just my 30 years on this earth, a lot more of them had to do with tradition than they did with doctrine. And I think we have to humble ourselves. But just because I don't like something doesn't make it biblical truth. I think it's something that we need to be aware of, especially as we think about reaching out to those that are unfamiliar with the way that we do things. So we've talked about all these things. We've talked about how we have to reach out to those around us, how, we, how the world is changing, and we have to make sure that we instill truths and that we balance those. Excuse me. With our tradition. But one thing that's really been bothering me lately, and uh, Brother John D. Berry talked about this at Polish in the Pulpit. For some reason, when, when we talk about the church, we talk about the church as an organization or an institution that's just trying to survive. Daniel chapter 2, verses 44, we quoted, there'll be a kingdom that comes and it'll last forever. But sometimes when we talk about it lasting forever, we just think like it's going to get smaller and smaller. And then finally Jesus is going to come back in this very small remnant that survived the world. That's not a church I want to be a part of. I don't want to be a part of a church that's just barely hanging on and barely scraping by. I want to be part of a church that's thriving, don't you? I mean, listen, we've got the greatest message that's ever been delivered. It hasn't changed. It hasn't lost its value or significance just because the world has changed. If anything, I think this world that we live in right now, this particular cultural climate is giving us a great opportunity. I don't want to survive and scrape by and, and watch the church grow smaller and smaller. I want to be just like that early church, man. They were growing. They were growing by multitudes all the time. That's what we want to be. And, you know, it's going to take some enthusiasm on our part. You know, and I know it's Wednesday and we're tired and... You know, and, and we're having, but we're talking about uh, how we can stand for truth in the culture around us, and how we're the only person that said amen the whole time. Uh, we got to develop that passion and that that seriousness and that excitement and that love of the truth. So, how do we go from a church that's surviving to a church that's thriving? I, I, I just wrote down a few ways. Hopefully, you can take these with you tonight. How do we do it? Number one, we love the truth. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 says we speak the truth how? How do we speak it? We speak the truth in love. We love the truth and we speak it in love and we let that passion be shown. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 4, Paul gives Timothy a very stern warning that there's going to come a day where people will no longer endure sound doctrine. He says, you know what? What does he tell them to do anyway? Preach the word. We have to love the truth. Secondly and equally, we have to love people. Jesus both loved the truth and he loved people. John chapter 4, he met that Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. John chapter 8, he met the woman called in the very act of adultery. 
And instead of condemning it, talking about how nasty they were and, and how they were on the outskirts of culture and how they were involved in sexual deviancy and all those things, what do you tell the lady in John chapter 8? Go and what? Go and sin no more. And he didn't just do it because he wanted to look like the hip preacher walking around. He did it because he genuinely loved people and cared about their souls. So we got to love the truth and just as much we got to love people. Thirdly, we have to live our faith. Our whole theme this year, practicing our faith every day. The reason that we're doing this series of lessons we're doing on Sunday morning about growing into godliness is because that's one of the areas where we fall short. Yeah, we're talking a good game, but when it comes to the way that we speak and the way that we look and our relationships with people, that Christians in general are falling woefully short. So we got to love the truth. We got to love people. We have to live our faith. Fourthly, we have to learn to discern. Is what I'm fighting about and what I'm standing for, is it truth or is it tradition? I have to learn to discern between those two things. Fifthly, we have to lean on each other. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1, you don't have to turn there, but he uses one of my favorite phrases in all the Bible. It says, to the people of like precious faith. We're similar because of our faith in Jesus has brought us together. And in difficult times when the culture around us is trying to box us in, we have to lean on each other. Number six, we have to labor for the Lord. We got to do a little bit of the dirty work. We got to take some time, take some energy and do some things that are a little uncomfortable. And then finally, we have to lead others to the truth. I want to share this story that I heard you last week, or share this story with you that I heard last week, and then we'll be done. In 1829, two men named George Wilson and James Porter robbed the United States mail carrier. Even back then, that's something that you did not do. You want to get in trouble really fast? Go and start messing with the mail. They will lock you away for the rest of your life. Don't do it. Both of the men were captured and tried in a court of law, and in May of 1830, both were found guilty of six charges, including robbery of the mail and putting the life of the carrier in jeopardy. Both received their, their sentences, execution by hanging. Porter was executed, but George Wilson wasn't. George Wilson had some important friends, and they went and they lobbied the President of the United States at the time, Andrew Jackson, and Andrew Jackson pardoned. George Wilson. He saved his life. And then, one of the most rare, unique things that has ever happened in the United States politics happened. He refused the pardon. George Wilson chose to waive and decline any advantage or protection which might be supposed to arise from the pardon and say that he had nothing to, dis- to say did not wish in any manner to avail himself in order to avoid sentence. So you had the President of the United States offering pardon to a man who was refusing the pardon. And the the legal system had no idea what to do. It went all the way through the judicial system and finally it ended up at the Supreme Court. Mr. Wilson's lawyers obviously argued that, look, the President has pardoned this man, you can't sentence him. While the state said, well, you can indeed sentence him because he's refused the pardon. It ended up in the hands of the Supreme Court and Chief Justice John Marshall wrote in one of the most interesting opinions ever written. A pardon is an act of grace proceeding from the power entrusted with the execution of the laws. But delivery of the pardon is not completed without acceptance. It may then be rejected by the person to whom it is tendered. And we have no power in a court to force the pardon on him. James Wilson was hung. He was executed for his crimes, even though he'd been offered pardon. And we look at that and and it's almost laughable to say and see how silly that can be. But there's a world full of people who have been granted a pardon And refuse to accept it. Listen, we're talking about Calvinism on Sunday night. And Calvinism would say, well, once you've been chosen to be pardoned, once you've been selected, once your sins have been atoned for, you don't really have any choice in the matter. But the truth is this. 
We have a choice every single day whether or not to accept the pardon that's been granted through the blood of Jesus. We have to accept that pardon and then we need to take it to the rest of the world and help them understand whether it's through sermon illustrations or just opening the text, whatever it is. The millennial generation is interesting. They don't, they don't have a lot of time for rah-rah preaching or preachers that say nothing. They want concrete facts. I've had the most success in studying with that generation just simply opening the Bible and, says, and saying, here, this is what it says. But we have to, the way that we survive, the way that we reach people, even in the changing culture, is, has not gotten any different. It's preaching truth and preaching about the precious blood of Jesus. If you would, bow with me. We'll have a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for this day for this opportunity to come together and study from your word and for this summer series, for all those that have come and spoken to us and all the lessons that we've learned. Father, we pray that as we turn on the TV at night and we look around in the world and we see it changing and not for the good, that we don't somehow run and hide in the shadows and think that your church is disappearing. We know that your church will stand forever and we know that it can have the opportunity to thrive if we'll be willing to work. Father, we hope that we can learn to accept change on things that don't matter, that we can understand that the way people process information has changed and the way that they receive it and sometimes the way that we present it can change. But the truth never changes. And we thank you for that, that the truth of pardon and forgiveness that comes through your son never has changed and never will change. Father, we pray that as we leave tonight and we go out into the world, out into that culture, that we won't yield to the pressure of change, but that we will stand, that we'll be steadfast, and that we'll be the examples that we need to be. Father, we humbly ask for forgiveness when we fall short. And we thank you for that vessel of forgiveness that comes through your Son. And it's in his mighty name we ask this prayer tonight. Amen.